Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, Park Marty, very good to see you again. Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Distinguished Public Lecture organized by the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies, or RSIS, as we know. <coughs> it's with great pleasure this afternoon that I introduce today's distinguished speaker, a very well known to all of us, Dr. Marty Natala Giova. Park Marty, as he is known to us, uh, is a distinguished visiting fellow at RSIS, and he is, of course, the former Minister for Foreign Affairs in Indonesia. The topic of Park Marty's speech today is on the question of foreign policy in the age of geopolitical competition. Is being neutral enough? Park Marty's lecture is particularly timely and important. Increased geopolitical competition among major powers, such as the United States, China, and Russia, has created increased tensions and pressure on other countries. These dynamics call for a closer look at how countries interact, the need for neutrality in a divided world, and the search for new approaches to international cooperation. With increased interdependency between nations, much more is at stake than ever to ensure peace, stability, and effective global governance. So it is in this context that we have Park Marty here today to share his views on foreign policy in the age of geopolitical competition. Park Marty's credentials for speaking to us on this topic this afternoon cannot be overstressed. He has been cited as one of the most respected foreign policy and international security thinkers of his generation, both within Indonesia, in Southeast Asia, and in the broader Asia-Pacific region. Park Marty is currently a member of the UN Secretary General's High Level Advisory Board on Mediation. He is also a member of the UN Secretary General's Advisory Board on Disarmament and the Board of Trustees of the United Nations Institute for Disarmament Research. Other UN appointments include the UN Secretary General's High Level Panel on Global Response to Health Crisis, as well as being President of the UN General Assembly's 77 session team of external advisors. He has many, actually many other appointments beyond the UN. He is presently Asia Society Policy Institute Distinguished Fellow, a member of the International Ac Academic Advisory Committee of the Oxford Centre for Islamic Studies, the Southeast Asia Advisory Board of the Centre for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS in Washington DC. So he is also a member of the Global Advisory Committee of the Jeju Forum in Korea, he, uh, the University of Western Australia's Public Policy Institute Advisory Board, the Board of Directors of the Global Center for Pluralism in Ottawa, and at the same time, Park Marathi is a prominent research scholar of the Bank of Indonesia Institute. He is also chairperson of the Asia Pacific Leaders Network for Nuclear Non-Proliferation and Disarmament. On top of everything, he actually found time to write a book as well, right? So he's also the author of the well-received book called Does ASEAN Matter? A View from Within. So Park Marathi is thus well qualified to share with us his views on the topic of this afternoon's distinguished public lecture, foreign policy in the age of geopolitical competition is being neutral enough. So may I now invite Dr. Marathi Natalie Gawa to deliver his address, please. Park Marathi. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kumar, for such a, a generous and kind invitation. Uh, but most of all, thank you to the uh, RSIS for a deep appreciation to the RSIS for its tremendous uh, thought leadership on many issues of our region. Uh, for the school have over the years provided such a conducive uh, environment and atmosphere for many uh, to further develop their thoughts and ideas and hopefully make uh, policy relevant uh, research and recommendations. Uh, today I have, I have intention to begin a conversation on an issue which I think is of some uh, relevance uh, to many, uh, not only here in Southeast Asia, uh, but arguably uh, beyond Southeast Asia. Uh, and hence, the nature of my remarks is more, is less of a fully thought out sets of ideas but rather more to initiate and hopefully to begin a conversation. And this time, unlike my usual uh, recent pursuit, 
is more is beyond ASEAN uh, in its scope, if I may. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, of the many complex dynamics in the current global landscape, uh, one inescapable feature uh, stands out, uh, namely the return of the age of uh, geopolitics. Perhaps more than any time since the end of the Cold War, deep geopolitical fault lines are being drawn across the world and significantly imposed over issues. Tectonic geopolitical shifts and tremor manifest in the almost incessant tensions and disputes between the so-called uh, major powers, the United States, China, Russia, and their respective allies as well as partners. Geopolitical dynamics infuse areas of areas beyond the traditional security domain. Unlike during the Cold War, both China and the US are actually deeply enmeshed and have common stakes in the current international order, and a complex interdependence mark their ties. Yet, tensions and rivalries permeate. Precisely, precisely at a time when issues emerge that defy national solutions alone, and demand multilateral cooperation, geopolitical divide and fault lines stifle common action. Management of the global commons, issues such as climate and health, for instance, are being weaponized. Diplomacy as preferred statecraft faces headwinds. Efforts at peace are hushed by war drums. Even efforts at stabilizing relations, for instance through military-to-military -military communication, face hurdles. Recent developments have done almost irreparable, irreparable damage to trust among nations. Trust deficit permeate and the risk of more open conflict as a result of miscalculation have risen. Bearing some unexpected transformative moment geopolitical push and pull is a reality that is likely to remain for the foreseeable future. Dear friends and colleagues, while much attention has tended to focus on the principal protagonists in this global geopolitical contest, the United States and its allies and partners, China and Russia feature prominently, little regard has been given to the great majority of states that are not integral part of the contending camps. Terms such as the Global South, emerging powers, middle powers, or even the rest of the world have been variously used without much academic vigor to describe these states. And more significantly, their role and place have tended to be defined and viewed from the prism and interests of the competing global geopolitical rivals, as countries whose supports are to be sought, or worse, as theaters where geopolitical competition can be played out in full. Their foreign policies have been variously described as one of being neutral, non-aligned, and perhaps less generously, simply one of hedging giving rise to the suggestion of lacking in principles. Such generalizations are being made despite the fact that, is, that there is clearly not a one-size-fits-all. Each country's situation, its pursuit of its national interests through its foreign policy, would be unique and specific to it. Likewise, at the regional level, the circumstances being faced by each region differ from one another. Competitive dynamics often prevail in a given region, quite independent from major powers competition. Clearly, for instance, the circumstances often historically defined being encountered by countries in Southeast Asia, Southeast Asia, Northeast Asia, and the Pacific 
some of the constituent elements of the often cited Indo-Pacific vary from one another. Despite such varying circumstances, one unique unifying feature stands out. None can escape the vagaries of the ever-deepening geopolitical competition among the major powers. The manifestation of major power competition may of course differ, sharpening pre-existing tensions and disputes between countries of a region or forcing countries of a region to align themselves with one of the major powers. Although the circumstances of countries and regions differ, manifested in the variation and differences in their foreign policy orientations, I would like to make the case that with the necessary foresight and sense of common purpose, it is not altogether impossible for countries to rally together or to band together over certain basic principles in response to the ever deepening geopolitical divisions. At the risk of caricature, I should like to cite two cases, historical cases, where we have seen countries, notwithstanding the variation of interests and foreign policy traditions that they have, have been able to rally together, to band together in response to deepening geopolitical tensions. The first is very close to Indonesia's heart, obviously, namely the 1955 Bandung Conference that brought together some 29 countries of Asia and Africa together in Bandung and provided the genesis to what, had be what would become eventually the non-aligned movement. Notwithstanding the fact that these countries or in some cases entities have barely just obtained or won their independence and despite the real problems that they were still facing at the time, they were able to identify and rally around the so-called Ten Principles of Bandung, which provided the signposts and the guidelines on how to conduct their foreign policy in a world marked by East-West divisions. The so-called Ten Principles of Bandung provided the basis for the development of the non-aligned movement and in the economic and social domain provided the wherewithal for greater coordination amongst the countries of the so-called South through the G77 group of nations that had at one time been quite prominent in the North-South debate. The key point here being notwithstanding the, the differences, variations in the interests, foreign policy orientations of countries of Asia and Africa, we were then able to rally around certain basic principles and that guide our behavior, our conduct vis-a-vis -vis the then raging East-West conflict. And the second illustration, and which is of course far more familiar to many of us in this room, is ASEAN's own experience how ASEAN, through its development from the original members to ASEAN 10, notwithstanding the obvious differentiation and variation in our foreign policy traditions, we have been able to develop a common ASEAN external position. Over the decades, developed from being essentially one of neutrality, through principles such as the zone of peace and freedom and neutrality, to the notion of ASEAN regional resilience, national resilience, notion of ASEAN centrality. In other words, at one time, there used to be an occasion when ASEAN's variation or even differences in our foreign policy tradition and outlook was an asset to ASEAN's external policies. We are able, because of our variation and diversity, to obtain the trust and comfort level of partners outside our region have been able to be brought under one ASEAN common tent. 
rather than becoming differences or variation did not become part of ASEAN's weakness but at one time was actually a source of ASEAN strength. In other words, the point that I wish to make is that there have been past experience that remind that or remind of the possibility that variation of foreign policy tradition and experience and outlook does not stand in the way of countries coming together to respond to a deepening geopolitical division. In contrast, the present day is notable for the lack of concerted and coordinated response to the widening geopolitical gulf amongst the so-called major powers. Despite the similar challenge faced by countries outside the contending camps, each seem inclined to manage these challenges and dilemmas on the, its own, in isolation from one another, and thus unable to draw on the amplified voice and influence that comes from greater policy coordination. In isolation, each is vulnerable to pressures, vulnerable to thinly veiled expectations from one of the major powers. And since the present day China-US divisions manifest in fields far beyond traditional political security domain, managing China-US decoupling is a task that is not an easy one to do. Further, in a world marked by extensive US-China footprints into the fields of the economy and technology, for instance, fully de-risking de from geopolitical dynamics may not be an option that is readily open to most countries. In the absence of collective and coordinated response, we have seen previously uncontested global principles and norms being cited by one of the geopolitical divide primarily to undermine the position of the other. For instance, references to such terms as rules-based international order, common security, or even to respect for international law and the 1982 UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, in certain cases have become associated with the position of one or the other of the geopolitical divide. The proverbial third voice or third space have become increasingly fragile. Efforts at peace and confidence building by well-meaning third parties risk mutual accusation by the protagonists of partiality. Suggestions for diplomacy and dialogue as modes to manage relations between major powers find little traction and too readily dismissed. Multilateralism, including the UN, is fraying and facing tests of relevance and effectiveness amidst the intensifying geopolitical tensions. In the face of such reality, what are the options facing countries that have chosen not to embroil themselves with one of the contending geopolitical rivals? Is there more that can be done other than exhortation for the geopolitical rivals to exercise restraint and expression of determination not to be forced to choose to remain neutral? How can the great majority of states outside the well-defined geopolitical rivals make themselves heard and more significantly make positive contributions independent of the well-defined geopolitical rivals seemingly bent on achieving preponderance over the other, irrespective of the cost to the global community of nations. Essentially, how can we protect our independent voice, our capacity to make independent choice? I believe that one preliminary and rather fundamental step would be for such countries, first and foremost, to establish a more systematic form of communication with one another, to instill a sense of cooperative partnership. 
to rid of their current inclination to manage the geopolitical push and pull in isolation. Such communications should be more than or at least built upon the type of issue-based communication and coordination that occur at multilateral fora on ad, on ad hoc basis. The significance of a recognition of their common conundrum in facing the deepening geopolitical division is one that cannot be underestimated, that they are a sizable and significant global constituencies. However, beyond simply the act of establishing communication, it is far more difficult to try to find a sense of being like-minded. Our countries outside the major principles or the major, the major so-called major powers able to identify certain themes, certain principles or ideas that can bring them together so that they're able to speak with one voice and amplify their relevance, amplify their role in our increasingly divided and fractured world. And this, uh, Professor Kumar, is the purpose of my hopefully initiation of a conversation. Are we able to identify ideas, thoughts, principles, that can bind countries that are so varied in their interests and yet have similar predicament in the face of the current geopolitical push and pull. Only for the sake of today's discussion, and I'd like to offer some two or three points or three or four points that I thought may be of some relevance to begin a conversation. I wonder, for instance, whether these countries that I'm trying to identify that are outside the protagonists, are we able to rally around the notion of their preference for cooperative partnership, rejection of block politics, the idea of promoting inclusion rather than exclusion, promoting multipolarity. More than simply rejection of block politics, I feel that such group of countries will need to define what it is that they are bringing to the table, what contribution that they can make. It is not enough to simply reject block politics, but we must try to divine, define how we can help ameliorate and address that division. In the past, when I talk about ASEAN and its centrality, I seize on the notion of promoting strategic stability. I do believe that this cluster of countries that are outside the US, China, Russia, and its partners' camps can assert a role by making the notion of promoting strategic stability as their key rallying point. How can we acknowledge and recognize that divisions and competition is a fact of life, but at the same time make the suggestion that even in the, the most competitive of environment, it does not have to be anarchical in nature. Rule even in the, the most deepest and the most uh, diff difficult moments of the Cold War. Even then, there was still some recognized rule of the game between the Soviet, the then Soviet Union and United States. Currently, I feel that the current geopolitical competition stands in sharp contrast. We saw a few days ago now when efforts are being made to revitalize or renew U.S.-China ties, even the act of establishing mill-to-mill -mill communication, an act that is normally more in the domain of uh, professional, unaffected by political ups and downs, even that space has not be become immune. <coughs> 
and have not been allowed to prosper. So my first suggestion for such a, th uh, a theme that can bind potentially is the notion of not simply rejection of block politics because I wish to bring forth a more positive message but our support for the notion of strategic stability preference for cooperative partnership for multipolarity for inclusion to build bridges the second principle that I'd like to think may be of relevance and hopefully can bring us together is the notion of support for a holistic understanding of security that security is a common public goods that cannot be enjoyed by one side at the expense of the other I think this is a craft, an outlook that in ASEAN has managed to develop in a very sound manner that we recognize that we, we used to, well, at, there was a time that we recognized that security is a common public goods that it cannot be obtained at the expense of the other. Are we able to develop a more a broader, a more comprehensive, holistic notion of security, emphasizing common security, and even still in a more ambitious moment to think about human security. It seems a while ago now, but there was a time in the midst, amidst the pandemic, we were all in painful reminder, humbled, by the fact that uh, we actually face this common challenge as a, at the human level in a most existential form. So when we speak of security, is it, does it suffice to simply speak of security as an interstate concept or far more fundamental way when we speak of existential threats such as pandemic or climate and many other transnational issues. I would like to think that countries outside US and China and Russia that are so deeply embedded in their own respective position that we can offer a more inclusive, a more common, emphasizing the notion of a common security. Rejecting the notion of a balance of power with its inclination to create action, reaction, more armaments, but less security for all. In the past, I used to speak of a dynamic equilibrium for our region, a notion that we must promote predictability of behavior in our Indo-Pacific. A third point, and I promise that I won't go much longer, too, much, too long, the third point is our common belief in the efficacy of diplomacy and dialogue. I think our region here in Southeast Asia, we have had our sufficient on our plate in terms of intra-Southeast Asia problems, challenges between our region and outside the region. But all of us, thanks to the wisdom of leaders past through modalities such as the TAC, we have come to recognize that the TAC, the non-use of force principle, peaceful settlement of disputes has become such an ingrained part of Southeast Asia's uh, uh, code of behavior. I wonder whether this could become a rallying point as well for those countries outside the US, China, Russia and their partners to speak more forcefully in favor of diplomacy and dialogue as a modality for settlement of disputes. Of course, fully respecting the right, charter mandated right for, of states for their self-defense, but less reliance on military means, more reliance on diplomacy and dialogue. I'm afraid in the current era,
we are seeing more and more communication being relayed, being, com being conveyed less through the words of diplomacy but more through deployment of military assets. Whenever political tensions rise, the first casualty often case is diplomatic communication. I think such a group of countries outside the contending camps can wage peace more forcefully, wage peace more aggressively to speak up on the Ukraine situation, for instance. We have had quite a few peace proposals in recent weeks from many a quarter and almost all of them very quickly were quickly dismissed out of hand. I, I am imagining a world where all these well-meaning and well-intentioned countries without any interest in the Im immediate issue at hand were to be better coordinated to compare notes beforehand and act in concert. Acting collectively it becomes less easy to be dismissed out of hand as if this is well-meaning but not well under, uh, not well reason initiative. My final point, uh, dear friends and colleagues, on, on issues that may bind us may be a little bit more tricky to try to f find commonalities because it, it's, it relates to our own respective internal developments. Yes, of course, we will all be aligned and in support of the notion of state sovereignty and territorial integrity. But at the same time, I think we have to recognize that recent developments have reminded that often case internal domestic dynamics, complex ones, internal essentially, have global ramifications have ramifications on the conduct of foreign policy. On diplomacy, certainly. Agreements that are already difficult to achieve on their own merits, on their own case, become especially even more complicated when we have parties that are looking more towards their own internal constituents rather than to their partner in negotiation. This nexus between internal and external, how can we ensure that they work in complementarity in support of our common objective is one that I think requires a great deal of uh, thinking through. Actually, again, when I think about all the elements that I had highlighted just now to uh, the three or four points, thankfully ASEAN, in the case of ASEAN, on paper, we have the wherewithal. On this last point, on the nexus between internal and external, isn't the ASEAN community project, especially the, the notion of ASEAN political security community, isn't that an attempt to provide an alternative approach that in the previous time seems to suggest as if there is a, a separation, a disconnect between notions such as respect for good governance, democratic principles, and the idea of state sovereignty. But my purpose, uh, Professor Kumar, as I had said at the beginning uh, this afternoon, is not really to provide a fully thought through, thought out um, solutions, but really to try to encourage um, conversation, hopefully, is there a constituency? Are we a constituency outside the contending geopolitical rivals? Is there like a global movement for diplomacy and for dialogue, so to speak? A third voice 
a third force? I think that is the first question that we have to ask ourselves. Because at the moment, I feel that we tend to view these things in isolation from one another. And yet my own informal communications with colleagues from other parts of the world, upon them, upon hearing of our predicament, and us, me, of hearing of their predicament, I realized that actually the predicament or the conundrum is quite almost a common universal situation. And if we can assume that geopolitical push and pull is to remain, then we better get our act together. Because otherwise, in isolation, we will be weaker, we will be pushed and pulled, and therefore being simply neutral is, in my view, to my own question, is not enough. Because it is a matter of time before we are being picked out and be asked, are you with us or against us? Identify the constituency, recognize the constituency, and secondly, identify the issues that binds us, if any. And my final, final point, uh, Professor Kumar, is that one issue that I should have mentioned before when I speak about um, uh, principles that may bind us is actually our views on multilateralism as well. How do we have a common view on multilateralism that is fit for purpose for 21st century challenges? Or is the current multilateral institutions that we have a remnant, a snapshot of a world decades 1945 vintage? Are we not amplifying our voice? Do we have a sense of ownership and participation in such multilateral organizations? I think this is an issue that can also bind us together. I mentioned to Professor Kumar earlier, I made reference to the um, recently concluded High Seas Treaty with the significant role being played by Singapore as it's presiding uh, in the presiding in, in presiding over the process. To me that is an, an example of what could occur if these public spaces, common good issues, are allowed to be addressed on the basis of their own uh, the nature of the challenge rather than be push and pull by geopolitical push and pull. We need to empower, we need to earn our relevance, and I hope we can begin that conversation. Thank you, Professor. Thanks, uh, Dr. Martin Nadigul-Java. Uh, Pak Marathi has uh, kindly agreed to uh, have a session with us to discuss uh, issues arising from his talk. Uh, as we, <coughs> the uh, colleagues here, think about the kind of questions you uh, would like to ask or raise to uh, Park Marty, I will uh, try to set the ball rolling in my capacity as the moderator. So Park Marty, thank you very much for uh, your excellent, uh, concise uh, comments about uh, what I took to be <coughs> your idea of uh, having uh, a vision of beyond uh, just neutrality, but perhaps I would say, in your view, we need to have uh, a vision of neutrality plus as we discussed previously, uh, where essentially we, in, in addition to, for this block, uh, well not block, but a constituency of countries that are not part of the two uh, contending geopolitical uh, spheres, so to speak, uh, there needs to be uh, an, a stance of neutrality plus a positive vision, and you articulated certain principles of this po a positive vision, for example, strategic stability, uh, pushing for strategic stability, pushing for multipolarity, uh, inclusiveness, uh, rejection of block politics. You talked about uh, how this uh, constituency of uh, like-minded states could also uh, push for a more holistic conception of <coughs> security, particularly human security, uh, and also the belief 
in uh, diplomacy and dialogue. Very much like uh, within ASEAN, we have the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation, TAC. Uh, and of course, the, your final comment about how we need to try and uh, perhaps refurbish the multilateralism process in a way that is fit for purpose in the 21st century. So you also mentioned, that, okay, these, these are ideas which I think uh, many of us here will, will uh, embrace to some extent because they make a lot of sense. Uh, but the question which you raise as well is, what is the constituency for these, for these ideas? Uh, just now, before we came here, we, we talked about how you know uh, some scholars in other contexts talk about how uh, regional uh, organizations could potentially play a more constructive role uh, in the international community. For example, if ASEAN were to collaborate with, say, the uh, Arab League or African Union or Gulf uh, Cooperation Council to sort of articulate uh, form a constituency to sort of uh, provide a third voice, so to speak, on some of these uh, uh, hot button issues. But, uh, but going by these principles you enumerated, do you think uh, this is one potential way to approach this issue? Thank you very much, Paul. I, I, I like that your term uh, neutrality plus just now. I, I, note, I noted that term. Uh, I didn't mention at all, if I'm not mistaken, in my, in my remarks earlier, about two things uh, that I could have mentioned. One is Indonesia itself, uh, the country that I'm from, and the non-aligned movement. Uh, Indonesia is relevant, very much relevant here because our traditional foreign policy orientation is one of bebas active, uh, independent and active, uh, and with the emphasis on the active, uh, in the sense that we are not simply independent or in the middle of uh, the geopolitical push and pull, Rather, we try to contribute substantively on, on issues. Uh, so the idea of neutrality, neutrality plus certainly is, uh, is uh, familiar to Indonesia's traditional bebas active uh, foreign policy or independent and active foreign policy. And the other, of course, uh, the fact that we have had in the past the non-aligned movement, which I mentioned via the Bandung conference, that had addressed the uh, the east west conflict uh, of the traditional type which on in the, on this issue on the most recent manifestation of geopolitical tensions are relatively dormant or, or not really providing a template on how to address this so i think the, the the suggestion or the reference you make to regional organizations could be one pathway uh, how we can develop a sense of uh, Consist, uh, commonality or, or a, sing, a constituency, uh, a, a third space, a third voice that we speak of. But, uh, you know, I mean, there are many uh, processes that it, it, is, it doesn't have to be a single process, but certainly the regional, intra regional, or inter regional uh, cooperative framework is one that is uh, quite efficient in a way because then you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, that is why in the past I have been rather, um, I have had different views to my, some of my ASEAN colleagues with their hesitancy to expand ASEAN's dialogue partner relations uh, with other, other sub-regions because there is a, 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 a common view within ASEAN that wants to cap ASEAN's dialogue partner status because it will mean more meetings. I, I fully understand hesitancy not to burden ASEAN with meetings, but actually if you think about it strategically, it is efficient uh, and effective for us to be simply uh, developing greater connectivity, greater engagement with our uh, like-minded or similarly inclined sub-regional organizations. Uh, that is why I think we had the Bali Concord III, uh, which speaks of ASEAN community in a global community of nations, ASEAN acting in concert on global issues. But certainly, the idea of uh, uh, cooperation between regional organization is uh, one of the pathway. But I think the, most, the more preliminary process is one of recognition that we are in a common conundrum, we are facing a common conundrum, and secondly, that to identify what are the issues that, that binds us. Uh, is there such issues that is sufficiently uh, 
substantive to bring us together, but at the same time respectful of the different uh, variations. So it has to be well calibrated, so to speak, yeah. Thank you. Uh, anybody would like to uh, ask uh, questions from uh, Dr. Mati? Uh, yes, please. Okay, uh, this gentleman here. Uh, so courtesy to uh, Park Mati, please kindly identify yourself. Uh, good, good afternoon. My name is Emmanuel. I'm from the Philippine Embassy in, in Singapore. Uh, first of all, thank you, Dr. Marty, for that very insightful and immensely thought-provoking lecture. You spoke about the continuing relevance of diplomacy as a tool for addressing our current uh, geopolitical challenges. And in that connection, I'd like to hear your assessment of how uh, the ASEAN, has so far uh, utilized its influence to help address the crisis in Ukraine. Uh, specifically, I'd like to hear what you think about uh, how, uh, where it did well and where it could do better in terms of helping address that, uh, the challenge. And if you have time, I'd like to hear the same uh, answer with regard to how uh, the ASEAN has used its influence to help address the crisis in Myanmar and, of course, the brewing a maritime crisis in the South China Sea. Thank you very much. Well, the, of the three cases that you had mentioned, uh, Excellency, is the obviously Ukraine, in contrast to Myanmar and South China Sea, uh, has the distinct difference of its geographical proximity uh, to ASEAN. So naturally, the natural inclination or the natural uh, inclination would be to view it as not immediately of pertinence to ASEAN because of simply by sheer geography. But thankfully, I think that has not actually been the case. Uh, ASEAN, I think, has re recognized from the beginning that there are fundamental principles here at hand that needs to be safeguarded. The notion of peaceful settlements of disputes, the nature of uh, respect for territorial integrity and state sovereignty. I think these are principles that are dear to ASEAN, and therefore, although Myanmar, the, Ukrainian, the crisis in Ukraine is geographically distant from ASEAN, I think it, were, it has not been that difficult for ASEAN to rally around uh, this uh, notion uh, that we cannot condone what has happened uh, in in uh, you over Ukraine, Russia's uh, military action uh, of Ukraine. But of course, naturally, ASEAN being ASEAN in terms of the variation of foreign policy, tradition, orientation, etc., the depth and, uh, and the, the, uh, the degree to the public utterance on developments in Ukraine has correspondingly varied as well. But on, on, the, on this issue, I think ASEAN collectively has not quite naturally, I think it would be too far, too much to expect for the ASEAN to make a direct collective contribution. But to the point that earlier that I had met, made, it would be even more, ASEAN's potential contribution would be even more amplified if we act in, in concert. For instance, if Indonesia a few weeks ago had suggested a certain potential uh, roadmap to the management of the situation in Ukraine. Uh, I wonder to what extent, whether before or after the announcement, there was any attempt to in engage our ASEAN partners to inform uh, what is behind the idea um, so that there is more better traction, a better understanding of what perhaps the proposal itself may be, may, may be looked at in greater detail, but the basic sentiment behind it. But in any case, uh, uh, ASEAN and Ukraine is, is in that way. Myanmar South East, and South China Sea is clearly of a different order. This is uh, an ASEAN internal challenge. Uh, both of them, especially Myanmar now, is really an existential uh, existential, not just litmus test. To me, it's an existential threat to the notion of ASEAN community. Because here we are, 
2023, when we're supposed to have an ASEAN community, we have a situation in Myanmar, Myanmar the way it is. Um, South China Sea continues to test us as well. But thankfully, on both counts, uh, we are not starting from scratch. On the South China Sea, from the early 2000s, through the DOC and the efforts at COC, there is an ASEAN-China track. On Myanmar issue, actually, even prior to 2000, uh, the recent coup, and as well as 2015, there has been actually a, a constant ASEAN engagement on Myanmar issue. It's only 2015 onwards when ASEAN chose to sort of disengage uh, from Myanmar's internal developments and assume probably that things are already on a, on a, uh, on a positive trajectory, as if it has become irreversible, then we find ourselves uh, now back to not just square one, it's actually f even more uh, f reversal than that. But at the moment, I have to say with the greatest, uh, I don't want to speak ill of any, anyone or anybody or any country, but uh, I must say that the, <laughs> the Myanmar issue in particular is like the most um, challenging for ASEAN. Uh, I, am, I, am, I am struggling to find uh, a, a positive in ASEAN's response to developments in Myanmar. The, the original problem itself, the challenge is the Myanmar issue itself is already sufficiently problematic and difficult. But what is more damaging uh, long term is the ASEAN's response to it. At best, at best ones of a sense of drift, uh, a sense of um, losing steam. There's a sense that there is momentum are being lost. And worse still, we are seeing uh, divisions within the, among the rest of ASEAN member states on how to respond. Um, that is how I, I honestly feel about it. But uh, then again, I'm not privy to the important and significant efforts being made by Indonesia uh, informally and quietly away from limelight. And I'm sure this kind of efforts are, 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 are taking place and making significant contribution. But uh, you know what we are seeing in public, especially with the uh, recent developments, the meeting in, in Thailand, it seems as if uh, it demonstrates, the it gives the it perception, perception of ASEAN uh, disunited. Uh, which doesn't have to be that way. But if you think about it, when we dealt with the Cambodian conflict uh, in the 80s, it was a combination of formal and informal diplomacy. Uh, Indonesia, when, they, when, when Indonesia undertook the so-called cocktail party process, uh, and that led to the Jakarta informal meeting, we were also at the time uh, accused of uh, you know, going outside the ASEAN track. But we needed to build bridges. We need to change the dynamics. So, uh, you know, I mean, it, it is what it is. But uh, at the moment, on the on the Myanmar, I think it's an extremely difficult uh, situation. South China Sea, basically, in my view, Excellency, the code of conduct efforts is um, becoming increasingly irrelevant to the facts on the ground. It may have been relevant 10 years ago, 15 years ago. But now, whatever is rich, the reality on the ground or at sea is, is, has gone far ahead. And the notion of having a code of conduct only for one geographical space, when the space is increasingly connected, South China Sea, uh, Taiwan Strait, East China Sea dynamics, uh, a code of conduct now is basically more needed for the entire Indo-Pacific rather than simply one limited geographical uh, space. But again, I have the benefit and advantage of ignorance uh, because I'm not obviously privy to what is happening uh, on the ground or in negotiation and dialogue. And I really admire the hard work that's being put into by, by all, all the ASEAN member states and not least of all by Indonesia as chair of ASEAN this year. Great, great, greatly admire their work. Thank you. Next, a couple of questions. So, yes, uh, at the back. Can you take
Uh, yeah. is, okay, yes, uh, Ravi, right? Yes, it is. Uh, good afternoon, Park. Uh, uh, early this month in Singapore, the Philippines uh, sat down uh, with the US, uh, Australia, and Japan uh, for a very interesting meeting. Uh, you mentioned the non-aligned movement, and uh, just a few days ago, uh, one of the founders of the non-aligned movement uh, alongside uh, your country and Yugoslavia had a very interesting meeting in the White House. And uh, the, uh, one of the things that's uh, coming out of the joint statement is that the Quad will be strengthened now, these are two countries uh, with which you share uh, common seas. Uh, your own president, uh, Park, has uh, spoken about uh, the Quad and said you must uh, see it as a friendly outfit. What kind of pressures do you feel in Indonesia uh, again, uh, when so many of your key neighbors seem to be moving in particular directions. And is that moment of making a choice, has it come much closer to you today than it was maybe a year ago or two years ago? And what do you think can, uh, let's face it, what do you think China can do to, uh, to sort of uh, uh, ease the tensions uh, that are causing some of these formulations uh, to take shape. Thank you, Pat. Uh, I'll take one more question this round. Yes, please. Salam, Pat. Uh, my name is Vaman. I'm from the Australian National University, a visiting fellow of Australian, Australian Defence College. Uh, my question is on uh, ASEAN centrality, neutrality, uh, and unity with regarding to AUKUS. Uh, the reason I ask this question is because uh, when uh, my engagement with AUKUS member state, it is clear that in any major power conflict, AUKUS military forces will move into Southeast Asia if need be. So when I pointed out to them that ASEAN is neutral, they said ASEAN will do what it wants to do, we will do what we need to do. Okay. So do you think in any major power conflict, ASEAN unity or the idea of uh, neutrality will just disappear. Thank you. Easy question. No. <laughs> well, well, I'm glad the, the question uh, was back-to-back uh, -back in that way because in a way, uh, one is Quad, one is AUKUS to me, although they are two different entities and processes clearly, but it manifests the same uh, dynamic, uh, the same dynamic, namely the proliferation or the renewal of pre-existing so-called minilaterals uh, that uh, in a way can be said to circumvent uh, ASEAN processes. And uh, the first point I'd like to make, I think no one has ever pretended or assumed uh, or assert that uh, there's only one way, which is the ASEAN way. Uh, I think ASEAN has, has thrived in the past uh, by its capacity to coexist uh, with uh, pre-existing, long often historically predates ASEAN, uh, and able to coexist and, and, and grow together with all these minilaterals. But the, the difference this time, I think, is that these minilaterals, uh, the more recent minilaterals, whether it be AUKUS or whether it be QUAD, seems to be perception-wise, it may not be in actual fact, but perception-wise uh, is viewed to be part of a competitive U.S.-China uh, dynamic. Uh, the court, we have been in the, in the past able to put a lead on the court uh, by empowering ASEAN's institutions. I mean, the court predates, uh, it's not of a recent uh, creation, but we were able to put a lid on the court by, by empowering the East Asia Summit, having the United States and Russia join the East Asia Summit, uh, making East Asia Summit relevant, providing for the concern and, and, and the interest of all within one common tent. But ASEAN's own neglect of the East Asia Summit, in my view, making it such a 
uh, routine, regular meetings of leaders without much uh, substance has actually created uh, or created unmet needs. I mean, the, the, their needs and requirements that are not being met out there, and as a result, is being uh, fulfilled by these other minilaterals, such as the core that is now uh, being renewed and the AUKUS as well. So my first, uh, the first exit, the first thing that I would imagine ASEAN must reflect on is more in self introspection. Why is it that we have uh, these dynamics uh, now proliferating, and often case? third parties after their usual uh, uh, acknowledgement of ASEAN centrality in terms of formal statements, but in practice uh, they proceed in, in a different way. And what is more, uh, a little bit disquieting now, even within ASEAN itself, some countries are deepening their uh, ties and engagement with these mini minilaterals. So I would think that the first thing that ASEAN must must do is try to empower the wherewithal, the instruments that already have, and not to simply be routine in their in their approach and outlook. Uh, otherwise, I'm, I'm, I was about to say I'm surprised, but I will have to find a different word for it. But uh, Indonesia in the past, I can only speak of the past, have been extremely careful in in making sure that uh, ASEAN speak with one voice and collectively uh, on these external third party developments. Um, uh, it is not usual for Indonesia to quite readily say they are okay with this group and that group without making sure that everyone in ASEAN is already on the same boat. Normally, we take the entire ASEAN with us. That is why in the past, well, ASEAN Indonesia, did, we promote RCEP, but not TPP, uh, because RCEP is the ASEAN path. But as I said, I, I was about to say I'm surprised, but I will, I will leave my uh, thing. But yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what to, to, take, to make of this readiness to Embrace, I mean, to embrace, I mean, to, to see quote in the way that they have. But to me, to me, it's a, it's a, it's a illustrate the need for ASEAN to, to reflect uh, on its own uh, role at the moment. Uh, the Indo Pacific vision, for instance, is uh, the ASEAN Indo Pacific vision, uh, are the, the types of functional cooperation that it identifies in the latter part of the document? Is it, uh, are they solutions looking for a problem? Or are they really addressing the core issues of our region? Uh, I feel they are functional, very well worthy functional type of cooperation. No one can oppose, I mean, can, can deny or oppose this type of cooperation, but I wonder whether they really go to the heart of the matter in terms of addressing the, the, the issues at hand in our region. Thank you. Yes, uh, yes, there's <coughs> a question there. Yeah, we'll take two questions. <coughs> Hi, Paul. It's good to see you again. James from uh, RSIS, China Program. So my question to you relates to the military aspect of uh, this contest that you alluded to briefly earlier. And my question relates to this uh, purported project 141 regarding the setting up of bases in the region. So back to the question about uh, how states should manage this. What's your advice to countries in the region in rejecting becoming embroiled? Thank you, Pak. See the last part. What is, a, what is your advice to countries to reject becoming embroiled uh, in this great power competition? Because um, I, I don't think it actually benefits ASEAN that we already have northern flank being too close to one country. Thank you, Pak. Like, uh, I mean, defense, defense policy is obviously uh, a part of the sovereign uh, 
prerogative of ASEAN member states, and no one is pretending that ASEAN pursue a common foreign policy or common defense policy. But at the same time, I think uh, there is the assumption or the, the, uh, the practice of ASEAN being able, in, in the pursuit of individual ASEAN member states, in the pursuit of their own defense policies and foreign policy alignments, at least uh, uh, inform one another and consult one another of, of, the, uh, of the dynamics uh, that uh, underpin and the, uh, the rationale that um, imbue those type of efforts. Now, the last thing we would want is a Southeast Asia that returns to its previous state where we become simply host to the projection of major power uh, rivalries. After all, it is the seminal Bangkok Declaration, the original founding documents of ASEAN uh, that speaks of the temporary nature of uh, foreign military bases and that it not be used against one another uh, interests. So it is uh, of a, an issue of fundamental interest, but having said all that, uh, what is important, I think, is for countries of ASEAN to uh, have transparency, to, uh, to communicate with one another. The point that I was trying to make at the beginning, uh, that we need to identify that we don't have to deal with these issues uh, unilaterally or in isolation uh, from one another. And again, if I was along the line to, of the question on AUKUS and Quad, if ASEAN, all these recent developments, I think, whether it be the Philippines, vis the US, or uh, Cambodia on China, Vietnam and US, probably Indonesia and China, Indonesia and US, is really a wake-up call to ASEAN itself. Uh, why are we seeing uh, like an a la carte uh, uh, effort at securing security? Is the ASEAN home uh, fraying? Because normally, uh, we act in concert as an ASEAN 10, make sure that everyone feels accommodated and feel uh, that they are being, it's not obviously a collective uh, security organization like NATO, but I think ASEAN has in the past provided that sense that no one will be left on their own. Now, if there is beginning to be segmentation as if uh, it's fraying that these are your problem, not our collective, the other nine problem, then countries will begin to pursue an a la carte a defense security policy, and sure, and quite rightly as well, uh, trying to secure uh, their immediate national uh, uh, security and, and interests. And in the past, Indonesia have never shied away in ensuring that everyone feel that ASEAN is actually providing that sense of, of, of commonality, of commonality of interest. Uh, and, but I don't know, it's at the, uh, a few days ago there was an announcement which I thought, wow, this is quite, quite significant here when Indonesia announced for the first time, apparently, that there was going to be a mili naval military exercises uh, amongst ASEAN navies, although it's meant to be on natural uh, response to, to uh, natural disasters, etc. But it is a collective ASEAN 10 and then supposed to be in the South China Sea which is quite a profound, important uh, announcement. But in the days after, we begin to see it wasn't actually yet an ASEAN 10 because one or two ASEAN member states say, oh, actually, no, we ha they haven't said yes to the announcement. Uh, and I think it was Cambodia and someone else, uh, was it Myanmar, uh, who said that there wasn't a decision yet on this uh, on this uh, so-called exercises and then subsequently uh, we decided someone decided to move the exercises away from the south china sea elsewhere so it's no longer in the contested in the in the in the south china sea now those uh, smart lawyers international lawyers will say oh this is like a uh, we are building state practice here someone could have complained and we had adjusted. For those who count these things, who see this as part of the building of state practice and customs, it matters. So I would have thought uh, 
an announcement of such magnitude would have been would need to be so mature in its preparation. Uh, you can't correct it as you you can't imp improvise as you go along because the damage would be done left and right. So this is what I think uh, consultation among ASEAN is so important uh, on, on such important, I mean, significant issues that affect all of us. Uh, we are not taking anyone's sovereign rights, but it's useful to compare notes uh, so that there is no surprises, uh, uh, you know, ahead of us. Yeah. Thank you for your insightful sharing. Uh, I'm Alden from Hua Chong Institution. Uh, my question to you is, given the repeated emphasis on the need for concerted efforts, do you think that a global concert akin to the Concert of Europe in the 19th century could perhaps be relevant and effective, or at least a better alternative at maintaining global stability amidst uh, today's age of geopolitical competition? Thank you. I'm not surprised by your reference to Europe's uh, experience in the so-called uh, era of uh, concert of Europe, uh, uh, where alignments and, and, and some of the, the heyday of uh, diplomatic uh, uh, efforts. But clearly, there is no one size fits all. Uh, the situation uh, in Europe prevailing at the time, the situation in, in our part of the world, in the Indo-Pacific, is, uh, I would Are, are rather uh, different, but at the same time, that there are certain elements that are that I mean, there are elements that I think is quite important for our part of the world. Uh, when we speak, when I speak about the need to have predictability of behavior, how notwithstanding the fact that countries, uh, I mean, I speak in the past of having uh, uh, that change is permanent. Uh, that uh, there is notion of uh, dynamics of power. Power constellation is constantly changing. Uh, there is no uh, stratified uh, uh, index of, of, of table of power. But how can we, amidst such a constantly changing power uh, power dynamics, we can we can promote a sense of uh, predictability of behavior? And this is where I think actually ASEAN have been especially good at in the past. We have been, uh, despite the lack of a pan-Asian uh, uh, structure, we have provided the uh, code of behavior in our part of the world through the TAC, through uh, concepts such as the Southeast Asian Nuclear Weapon Free Zone, etc. So this is where I think uh, one of the challenges uh, for our region uh, in ASEAN, how can we empower and and make relevant our, our uh, the instruments, the, the principles that we have enacted. For instance, uh, just now when we were talking more at the global level rather than at the ASEAN, Southeast Asia level, uh, is there a constituency that can rally around the notion of uh, non-use of force, and the notion of global, I mean, uh, peaceful settlement of disputes, of, of dialogue and, and diplomacy? I would have thought if ASEAN was to make itself heard, uh, contribute to this third space, one avenue, and especially given the increasing universalization of the TAC through accession by, by so many countries now, would be for ASEAN to take the lead at the United Nations through its General Assembly, for instance, to adopt a UN General Assembly on peaceful settlements of disputes, disputes, to codify the TAC straight to the global level. Because at the moment, the TAC is being universalized through incremental accession by ASEAN's partners. And that's becoming increasingly geographically uh, uh, expansive. Indonesia as chair of ASEAN, Indonesia that had prided itself in the past of being a leading voice at the United Nations, at the multilateral forum. One way to manifest that would be to take the notion of peaceful settlement of disputes, non-use of force, as ASEAN, 
together with, with, together with all the acceding countries to the TAC, to the UN General Assembly. How more current can it be than today, when we just witness uh, Russia's uh, military aggression in, in Ukraine? If there was a time when this, such an initiative would find traction, I think it would be now. Because there are people who speak about silencing the guns, promoting peaceful uh, dialogue. So again, uh, trying to take the conversation beyond ASEAN. I think ASEAN has a number of uh, uh, wherewithal and state practice that we, we can interpose, in, uh, uh, we can extrapolate to the wider region to, to secure this third space. Because if ASEAN is inactive, or if, if these third countries are inactive, a lot of these issues become co-opted, become weaponized by the contending parties. Look at the issue, the space on human rights and democratization. ASEAN, ASEAN used to own it in this part of the world. Through the ASEAN political security community, we have our own brand, our own approach on it, our own considered thought. But we chose to disengage. And now, when we speak about democratization, democracy, human rights, is viewed by China as a US attempt to contain it. It's being adopted or perceived to be adopted by one of the contending parties because we have been neglectful. Indo-Pacific, there was a time when ASEAN was in the lead. We were the first, one of the first to initiate the idea of Indo-Pacific in 2013. But somehow we chose to pause and others came in and now when the term Indo-Pacific is being used, is viewed again by China as being a US construct to contain China. Because we have been, we have been in abeyance, we have allowed global public good spaces to be weaponized. And the more we remain passive, the more these issues will be adopted by one of the contending parties. That is why I think it is urgent for us to quickly, not just ASEAN, but beyond ASEAN, to occupy this third space or third, yeah, third space or domain. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, this space will become increasingly uh, fragile and dissected by the two contending parties. And in the cold, during the Cold War, you can sort of hide uh, because it's mainly security issues, military issues, but now it's about trade, it's about technology, it's about health issues, climate change. All spaces are being occupied by the contending parties, and I think it's well worth having a conversation. Do we have a constituency? Is there a constituency? And secondly, what are the issues that bind us? Yeah. Any other questions from the floor? Yes, please. <coughs> Uh, thank you, Pak Marty, for the interesting lecture. Uh, I'm from the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Secretariat. Uh, my name is Ahmad. Uh, just wondering, uh, you mentioned about the third voice. So I wonder if uh, would economics or economic interests uh, would be a unif unifying theme or factor for the third uh, global voice that you've mentioned, or is it going to be just uh, another uh, divisive uh, factor instead? Thank you. Yeah, but uh, well, there was a time for those of us who are of uh, that vintage that we can recall the so-called North-South, North-South dialogue, North-South dialogue, and North-South division. Uh, G77 group of countries plus China actually, uh, and uh, Angtai. Uh, these are the terms or the the architecture at that at one time. Uh, define us uh, in, in global conversation, the so-called north-south uh, divide. And actually, at the time, uh, developing countries developing on the NAM cooperation in the political security domain also developed similar uh, coordinated response. And having served twice at the UN, you know, I mean, the, even today, I think they are still quite relevant, the G77, on some issues. But Increasingly, it's becoming more and more tenuous and more and more fragile to try to collaborate, coordinate such a 
can what can be a very cumbersome. Uh, you know, on the one hand, the numbers is our advantage. On the other hand, it's also our uh, our uh, challenge. How can we maintain uh, a continued uh, cohesion with so many uh, different uh, countries of different outlook? But I, I think uh, nowadays it's not it's not necessarily uh, all encompassing issues, but it can be more sub uh, divided into uh, little portions issue-based, uh, like-minded uh, countries, especially countries that are like-minded in terms of wanting to bridge uh, gaps, uh, wanting to bridge uh, divisions. Uh, I, I mentioned to Professor Kumar earlier, there was a time about 10, 15 years ago, I think, when Indonesia was being suggested to join the gr BRICS group of nations together with Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. Uh, but at the time, based on the wisdom at the time, I, I'm not sure if the same question was posed today, what would be the response. But at the time, we, we declined that suggestion because our instinct then was that we wish to avoid within the G20 uh, further divisions between the G7 group of nations and BRICS. And therefore, instead, uh, we came up with what's called MICTA, M-I-K-T-A. Mexico, Indonesia, Korea, Turkey, and Australia, uh, which at one time uh, the Australian wanted to describe as being a so-called middle power initiative. But Indonesia did, doesn't like the idea of middle being capped, our ambitions being capped at a, being a middle. So we chose simply to describe uh, ourselves in the way that we, I, I mentioned. But the spirit then was to connect, I um, mean to bridge the gaps. Uh, unfortunately, that notion didn't quite develop the way we, uh, uh, certainly the way I had hoped, but the, the, um, the, um, the, uh, gen the dynamic is similar, how we can uh, bridge divisions. Uh, you know, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but when, As when Singapore was chairing ASEAN a few years ago now, uh, Singapore took the lead on uh, ASEAN's co collaboration on digital uh, space which is, I think, tremendously important. Because here we are, this is a space that is becoming increasingly important and potentially divisive as well with the East-West, I mean, sorry, China-US division. And ASEAN, uh, through Singapore's uh, chairmanship, was trying to create, uh, establish norms and principles on how we can collaborate. So I think, uh, to your question, uh, no, this type of outlook, a third space, third voice, it's good to go, not only in the political security domain, but also in, in other spaces as well. But uh, you know, I think the first, the first hurdle we have to overcome is one of recognition that we are a constituency, uh, that, you know, that despite of our, our differences, our different situation, different geography, different history, outlook, foreign policy, we face the same conundrum uh, in the sense that we are being forced to choose. And being neutral, being simply in the middle, uh, is perhaps uh, good for now, but not for the long term, because otherwise we will be simply uh, pulled apart by this uh, US-China uh, push and pull. Yeah. Well, we have time for one final question. Anybody? No? That. Yes. Oh, Rory, wait for the mic, please. Yeah. Thanks. Pardon my ignorance, but uh, could you please expand on what you just said, that the Indo-Pacific was something that was actually resident within the ASEAN as a concept before it became, it was adopted by the United States? Yes, because uh, in 2013, uh, Indonesia had already proposed uh, an Indo-Pacific uh, outlook, uh, Indo-Pacific, well, we had already initiated a conversation on the Indo-Pacific as a geographic space uh, through its statement in CSIS in DC in 2013. In the first of the ASEAN summit of 2014, uh, that was included in the summit, in the chairman's statement of the summit. In the second of 2014 um, statement, and subsequently, it becomes more or less and become more and more diluted until it disappeared altogether from ASEAN's uh, lexicon until President Trump reintroduced it in Vietnam 
uh, well, well, President Trump picked it up in Vietnam at the APEC uh, summit. And I think ASEAN quickly recalibrate when they met in, in India, for New Delhi, for an ASEAN, ASEAN India commemorative summit, perhaps, uh, when the idea of Indo-Pacific was, was reintroduced by ASEAN, but suggested as being a, f an, a new one. But anyway, it was already introduced. But more than mere statements, if you think about it, pa, when you look at ASEAN actual state practice, ASEAN Regional Forum, whose footprint uh, extends beyond East Asia to the Indian Ocean, uh, members of like Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, India, Pakistan, that is already Indo-Pacific in practice. The East Asia Summit that includes not only, or as originally suggested, only include the past three countries, but also include India, Australia, uh, New Zealand, right from the beginning, is already Indo-Pacific outlook in practice, Indo-Pacific vision in practice. So I, I somewhat, uh, I'm a little bit concerned if now ASEAN is suggesting, talking about mainstreaming Indo-Pacific outlook onto ASEAN work, because then we are really erasing, self-erasing our own past, uh, for want of a better term, achievements or, or, or practices, precisely when the field is very congested, as if we are just now only beginning uh, to have a conference on the Indo-Pacific so-and-so uh, without building on what we already have, especially East Asia Summit, ASEAN Regional Forum. This is not a time for us to self, uh, in, in self limit ourselves and be as if we are just now only waking up to this notion of Indo-Pacific. Uh, this is what I was trying to say. And, and how, why that is the case, then you have to look at the internal ASEAN dynamic, why certain ideas come, go uh, back and forth, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, I'm sure you'll agree with me that we have uh, learned a lot from uh, Dr. Mati Nataligawa this uh, afternoon. I myself uh, always enjoy listening to you, uh, Park. Uh, so I I've told uh, Dr. Mati that uh, he should uh, consider writing this as an article, uh, which, will be, which will definitely be published, and I think all my colleagues here would definitely want to read it. So uh, please uh, join me in thanking uh, Park Marty for his uh, comments this afternoon. Thank you.